Hey guys, welcome back to the preview show. As always, I'm your host, Nico Sorrell, and I'm joined today with Trevor. Hunter is out of town, but we'll be getting his picks in later. Trevor, how are we doing today, man? Good. Ready for the Des Moines Challenge. Very exciting event. Ready to hopefully have a bigger gallery this week compared to last year. Mm-hmm. Um, slight shots fired, I guess, but <laughs> yeah, pretty there. It should be interesting. They had a couple of um, changes to the course. Um, this is still going to be at Picard. Park, I Pickard, guess. I guess. Pickard? Pickard Park. Okay. Uh, still in Iowa. Um, the MPO is going to be playing the Golds layout as the FPO is going to play be playing the Silver layout. There were a couple changes to the course, so we're going to go ahead and go over them. Uh, on hole two, uh, the FPO layout, the Silver layout, was on the left side of uh, the MPO. Now it is swung to the right side of it, so it should give the FPO still, I would say, a hyzer flip. Um kind of stock shot to approach the basket. Um, But it should play out typically pretty easy, I would assume. Um, Hole nine looks like MPO got its own basket this year. And so they pushed that back uh, another like 15 feet or so from 290 to 305. Hole 10, they did a different basket placement for the MPO. Um, The MPO is actually about 15 feet further while they brought the FPO uh, 70 feet back so it should be a little bit easier for those uh, for the FPO field to get there and then you've got uh, hole 15 and hole 17 uh, it's kind of the same idea MPO basket pin placement got pushed and then the FPO got brought in um, what do you think these changes are going to do to our scores um, especially on 17 which I know um, just watching coverage last year it was already a difficult shot to just hit the gap straight on and make it all the way to the basket one shot uh, yeah so th- yeah it's it's an interesting course uh, Des Moines is very unique in a few ways uh, and you kind of touched on it with all the changes and every change that I saw um, most of them you already highlighted um, but you know hole one they tightened up OB you see OB tightening up on a few different holes mm-hmm. um, and then also like hole four uh, they moved the drop zone to now if you miss the long par three water carry you now have to throw over water again so every thing that I saw uh, was basically, hey, let's make this course a little bit tougher. They, let's tighten yeah. things up a little bit, uh, which is interesting because scores weren't super low last year. But this course is really special because it is one of the shorter courses on tour. Uh, none of the par fours or par fives are super demanding in distance. And the par threes are incredibly short. There is eight holes under 350 feet, eight holes on the pro tour. Beaver State, for example, one of the longer courses had zero holes under 350. Their shortest hole was 390 feet. Um, yeah. So distance on this course is not necessary. Now, I will say on there is some longer like uh, there's I think there's a 588 foot par three. There's a 470 foot. Both of those are slightly downhill, um, but they are there is some longer holes like that. The par fours, there's certainly uh, par fours where distance can gain you advantage. You see kind of the theme at this course be more open par fours and uh, those those tighter, more technical par threes. Another way that they defend these par threes are islands galore on the front nine. Uh, you've got holes. Well, four kind of plays like an island with a long water carry, not technically an island, but then five and seven are islands. Uh, and you're just going to see a lot of tight greens as well. It, you know, circle two on a lot of these shorter par threes just isn't good enough. You're going to be out of bounds. Um, so it, it's very interesting in the sense that it's very different than what we've seen a lot on tour. So many shorter technical holes and even the par fours that don't look that crazy difficult there. The fairways are very well defined and pretty tight. So there OB is going to be the main defense of this course. And that's basically uh, what makes this course from a birdie or die course. I mean, if you're just looking at them, if you're looking at the flyovers and you ignore OB, you're thinking this course is short. It's super attackable, but the OB is the only thing that really protects this course. Um, Like you mentioned, there is some new FPO baskets now. Um, They also lengthened a few tees. Uh, I expect the scores, um, you know, I, I don't think that are going to change a ton this year. I don't think any of the changes were super drastic. I think a lot of players having another crack at this course will will change up their game plan because I think there is some strategy involved. But I, I do think uh, a lot of the a lot of the holes. I mean, like I just said, eight of those holes under 350. It's route one disc golf. Like there is only one way to play it. You you try and hit the line. You try and park it, uh, and that's about it. Um, 
so yeah, I, I expect I, I, it's entertaining. It's going to be an entertaining event. I, I think that this is like a very different style course um, than a lot of the stuff we see. I, I know there's a lot of exciting shots. Those island holes I mentioned play very exciting. You have the really big like mulch octagon on the one. You've got some water carries that get really cool galleries behind them. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think it's a cool layout. It's it's very interesting how they were able to take a course that only plays over a little over 9,000 feet for reference beaver state uh, some other courses play like 11 maybe even 12,000 feet sometimes um and they've made it challenging to where i think the you know a lot of premier golfers were finishing the tournament around 15 under last year uh so nothing crazy and and that is just this is a uh, perfect testament to what out of bounds and well protected greens can do, even when you don't have a ton of length to play with. And, you know, they mix that with some challenging lines as well. And, you know, I've said this before, but just the presence of of out of bounds makes a tee shot harder. Uh, and not just because you're going to land there, you know, sometimes, but just because it's in your head. You know, they, there's there's a few holes on this course. Um, I believe it's hole five comes to mind where it's a pretty short hole, uh, just a water carry to an island uh, with this somewhat generous green. But, you know, you, we've seen a lot of players go out of bounds on the hole last year just because the pressure and the gallery adds to that as well. So uh, I'm really excited to see how the course plays this year. I think it'll be similar to last year. And I'm curious to see if there's certain players, um, namely Calvin Heimberg, Ricky Wysocki, that that played not well last year, if they can make corrections and if this course plays uh, softer than it did. Mm -hmm. So we were just talking about the course changes, but we haven't even talked about how the weather typically affects this course. Last year, we saw that the wind was uh, kicked up and it makes those OB, uh, the Thai Islands, like even more difficult. Yeah. So it'll be interesting to see how that plays out this weekend because it looks like on Friday it's going to be around 10 miles an hour. Not terrible, um, but then it will kick up for the rest of the weekend over 15 miles an hour. Um, and then the weather for the sun is going to be like 15 or it's going to be in the mid to high 80s. And then uh, not really a huge chance of rain, a little bit on Saturday, not too much on Sunday. So it should be fairly dry for them. Um, so Parker Welk um, is rated 10-10, and he just beat some of the best disc golfers in the world. Like, hands down, it was ridiculous. It was super cool to watch. How does his victory change his mindset going into this weekend, and what does it do for the confidence of other younger players who have that low rating, they think they can compete, but they also see, um, like, Ricky, Calvin, you hear Eagle, and you're like, dude, I will never be able to match these dudes. What does that do for those younger players, like, seeking their first win, making their stamp on the Pro Tour? Yeah, it's a big deal. I, I actually got to talk to him last night, and he, he actually mentioned that he felt like he became a beacon of hope for the bottom of the field because basically what happens when a player like Parker Welk wins, and I think he was he was outside of the top 100 when he won, it – so, and this is uh, this isn't perfect reasoning, but it somewhat effectively says that okay, if that player, if the player, let's say ranked 120th, can win, that means that, like I said, not perfect reasoning, but that means effectively that any player inside of him in the world rankings could also win. Which, at, beyond that, I mean, I don't, I'm not sure who the highest ranked winner we had had previously uh, this year, but typically going into events, you're not even eyeballing anybody outside the top 35, 40. And that's starting to change a little bit, but this was a huge step in that direction. I mean, I, we'd never seen anything quite like this. Um, I think Parker, you know, he is going to have certainly a challenge uh, matching last week's performance. I don't expect him to, to double up or anything, but it certainly is just a new uh, thing to be paying attention to that there, you know, there are so many players that you can consider. And, and also, you know, just because somebody hasn't been there before, if they get the hot hand, there are a lot of disc golfers out there that are capable of winning just because they're playing really, really well that weekend. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, and especially um, I would say this course would suit obviously a lot of our technical throwers mm -hmm. Um and for me, one of the names that stands out is Isaac Robinson. Yeah. I feel like he navigates courses very well. So I think this will probably play, play to his strengths. Um, 
but I think we're just gonna have to find out this weekend. Yeah, I I, I was definitely looking at Isaac. Um, I like him at this event, but you know what I've kind of determined about Isaac Robinson when I was looking at his, you know, he didn't play super well at this event last year, mm -hmm. and I'm kind of looking over his statistics because fairways hit is kind of what I'm keying in on for this event, and like C1, C2, and regulation part percentage. You got to throw the disc well, stay stay in bounds. Uh, that's where a lot of the better players got themselves in trouble. I think last year, you know, Calvin Heimberg was abysmal hitting fairways uh, during the event. And that cost him a lot. Um, Isaac Robinson, I'm kind of just say, thinking at this point is a little bit streaky because at his best, you think of him as a very good uh, at hitting fairways and very mm -hmm. good at making putts. But if you look at his season long rankings for those stats, they're not overwhelming at all. Uh, his, his putting his C1X putting for the season isn't that, you know, it's not that crazy. I believe he's in the low eighties. Um, so I, I think that he is certainly a player that could do really well. If he comes out hot round one, you can bet on him, but it's not somebody that I'd, going into the tournament, you can just very easily say with confidence, this is going to be a great weekend for them because I think he can just struggle with inconsistency week to week. Yeah, definitely. Um, so this week also, Calvin, this time last year, he's, he was uh, 35th at the end of the scores. Um, and last year, we also saw him get uh, three events where he was... 20th place or higher um, this year. He actually hasn't even hit that mark once he's uh, his worst rank was 16th. Do you think that this week could be the week that he blows up and he goes over that 20 mark or do you think he's going to stay consistent like he has this year? Yeah, I think last year was a fluke completely. Uh, like I said, I think fairways hit that's where he struggled last year and that's he leads the, the entire tour and fairways hit this year. Uh, so, you know, there's no reason to believe there's something to be said sometimes for, oh, well, of course sets up just not super well for this player doesn't play to their strengths. Calvin doesn't have weaknesses necessarily. Uh, and like a fairways hit is his strength. And when fairways hit is your strength, you're not going to be playing bad disc golf. I think last year was a fluke. I expect him to play really well at this event. I think he could absolutely win this event. Um, I'm not sure, you know, when you throw in all the short par threes, it becomes very difficult to predict an event uh, just because there's going to be, it just requires a certain extra level of accuracy. It's not just like a par four where you have a bigger window. There's a few gaps on this course that are very small that you have to hit um so you know it'll be interesting but yeah i think last year i think that is a complete fluke i don't expect a performance like that i would be shocked if he finishes outside the top 15 yeah same um we're gonna go ahead and throw it over to fpo so at ddo we saw valerie mandahano shoot a 70 a 75 um and so it was kind of like oh she's getting her legs under her, he's, she's warming up but then the last round she actually shot, shot a 66 which was only four strokes off of the hot round for that day um do you think this is a good indication for uh valerie going forward that people can be confident in her play um put her in her in their pick six what are you thinking about that uh, yeah, I think it's still a little too soon to tell. I, I watched her play last weekend and I saw rust. I saw her look a little bit almost lethargic, like and like trying to get back in the swing of things. Um, you know, it, it there's definitely like signs of her old game. Absolutely. You know, there's still the distance concerns off the tee at this course. That shouldn't be a huge factor. I think if she can find her release and have some good accuracy, this could be a great event for her to win potentially if she can or find her stride, I should say, because, you know, that's a lot to ask to come right back and win. Um, so definitely someone to look out for will be Val this week. I, I, I still am not convinced that the rust has been completely shaken off. I'm not expecting any crazy fireworks. But I would I would be more comfortable saying, OK, this is a great spot for her to get a top 10, you know, fire off a couple of decent rounds and get back in the mix. OK, gotcha. Um, also, last week, we saw Holland Hanley and Ella Hansen, of course, on the week that uh, we were all, I would I would say, in unison about yeah. them not being a factor. Uh, of course, they take second and third. Um <laughs> and Holland actually took Haley King to a playoff while Ella Hansen was sitting one stroke back. Like it was a really close finish. What does this do for their confidence heading into this weekend? Um, yeah, I, it was very funny. Definitely that we were kind of like start. I mean, this is kind of how it works with any M MPO FPO. As soon as you write off a player, they figured out because that's golf. Um, you know, we can only, we can only guess really. Yeah. Um, I still think Ella Hansen to me looked is about what I expect to where 
can be very competitive at certain courses. I didn't see a lot of killer instinct down the stretch. I'm still not confident that she can, that she's going to win. Uh, I think eventually she will, but I'm, I, you know, I'm, I'm still in kind of in the same boat with her. She had a good weekend hall and Hanley. Now I saw, uh, something different out of her, which was clutch putting down the stretch and, and good putting for the entirety of the event. And that is what she's been missing. That's a huge confidence booster. What actually let her down in that event was her throwing, um, you know, missing that Island twice. So I, I do think that Holland Hanley has elevated her status and probably gained a lot of confidence knowing that she was able to putt well enough to keep herself in it. I mean, heck the basket let her down a few times. <laughs> so I, I do think that is a huge confidence booster for her knowing that she was in the heat of the moment, was able to make putts. That's not what cost her the event. It's something that is more reliable for her game. Okay. So they should, so should they be feeling good about this weekend or yeah, I, I would think so. I don't now. I don't necessarily think that this course um, you know, sets up to either of their strengths. I, I, more so, Ella. I think Ella still relies a lot on power, a power forehand. She'll probably shred the par four, but those technical par threes, uh, Holland, I, I could see doing well on those. I'm not sure if that's quite Ella's game. Uh, I, I think FPO, you know, with the exception of maybe some of the very, very top players like Kristen, you know, the, it, it could be a real mixed bag with this course. It really could be because yeah. it's similar to like when you see shorter courses in the FPO field, it brings so many other players into play that that lack the distance and it becomes very exciting to watch. Yeah. Um, also, last week we saw Haley King. Um, I, I should give her an apology because I haven't talked about you at all. Um but you have been performing quite well this season. Um, in the fa the last five elite series or majors, uh, she has been placing 11th or best. But if you take out her Music City Open finish at 11th, the last four, she she has finished top six or better. Um, obviously, we've seen that she can play. Um, but when do you think we start seeing her as someone uh, like prime Valerie Mandahano, where she was at least seen as like the biggest threat to Kristen Tatar's reign. Yeah, I, I think I think she's kind of uh, entering that. I, I do think that she's been a little under the radar this year. Uh, hadn't won yet, and that is a big part of it. I still think that Haley King, you know, plenty of talent to win, clearly, uh, at really starting to find her putt consistently. And that's been huge. Uh, stroke is smooth, but I, yeah, very, one of the smoothest putting strokes there is. I, it's incredible. I uh, I do think that when she is not in it early, she struggles. There's a lot of disc golfers that are like that. I think that she can get a little checked out maybe, but I do think down the stretch and later in tournament, she's becoming a lot more dangerous and that's huge. I think she's kind of starting to settle in. Um, so I would say right now to me, she feels like the biggest threat to Kristen. Yeah, absolutely. All right. So we're going to go ahead and throw it to our bold predictions presented by third wave. Trevor, what can you uh, tell us about that since Hunter is not here? Yeah, I got to fill the big shoes, but uh, Third Wave Coffee, they're our beverage sponsor for the show. So they're committed to ethical and sustainable sourcing for all their coffee and have 20 single origin coffees from all over the world in stock right now. Plus, they just released a new Bogey Bros blend, which you got right here. Um, this is a blend that was actually tasted and approved by myself, Hunter, and Connor, and it's perfect for all of you who are looking to dip your toes in a specialty coffee scene. For our listeners, you can get 20% off your order with code DISCOFF if you go over to third dash wave dot coffee um that's code disc golf at third dash wave dot coffee and you can pick something up and try the bogey bros blend it is delicious so make sure to check out third wave coffee and thanks for sponsoring the show third wave yeah good stuff what is your um bold prediction my bold prediction um is kind of tied into my other predictions but uh not directly and it is that Silas Schultz is going to take a top five at this event. I think that he is super overlooked right now. He just took 12th, I believe, at DDO, making almost no putts. Brody, before tour life last night, was throwing out some like ridiculous stat about how he, if he made all his C1 putts at, at the latest final round at DDO, he was shot like 14 under at ECC. T to green, there is just nobody better right now, it seems. He is just insane. And uh He's been on a tear whenever he's on tour. I do think that at a, at a course like this, where I see be getting off the tee uh, such a high importance, I think Silas Schultz is going to have a really big event. Yeah. Um, what do you uh, think about, or what do you have for your uh, MPO or FPO? 
Um, yeah. So MPO, we'll just do mine first, and then okay. we'll and then we'll toss it over to Hunter for his. Okay. Um, so my MPO predictions, uh, a lot of these have to do with fairway hit percentage. That's kind of what I'm keying in off of. And then also a little bit of context from last year's Des Moines challenge. You always have to consider that those are kind of what I was keying off of though. So third place, I'm actually going with Anthony Barella, uh, a decent at hitting fairways played decent at the event last year. I've just seen him floating around a lot this year. And I don't know. I, it's, this one's kind of, that's kind of a hunch pick. I wasn't really sure who to slot that in there. That one seems more like a bold pick because whenever I think of him, I really don't think of like technical shots. I think power thrower he well he he's Person. very he's a very solid par three player he's just not a great putter that's what it comes down to if you look at his statistics this year he hits fairways he can get circle one circle two in regulation he's just not making putts so we'll we'll see now second place this pick i really like uh and that is evan smith so evan smith last year was leading this event going into the final round ended up in third he just took third at ddo um, another guy who's very high top five in fairways hit percentage this season, really, really like Evan Smith. He could sneaky win this thing. And then number one, I'm going to take Calvin Heinberg because I think that last year was a complete fluke. He's leading the, leading the tour right now in fairways hit. And I, I just I have no reason to believe other than that weird event last year, which I, like I said, I think was just a one-off thing. I have no other reason to believe that he wouldn't perform really well at this event and he's due for a win at okay. this point. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, so I'm moving to my FPO then. Okay. Um, FPO picks. So I've got... This is a little bit trickier for this event. I think it's kind of a mixed bag. Um, I'm going to go with Haley King in third, just kind of carrying the momentum. Holland Hanley in second, similar thing. And then Kristen Sitar in first. I think Kristen Sitar... Uh, this will be an interesting one for her. She's known for hitting fairways. Uh, it's going to depend on how she plays those par threes. I think that this could be... She could have some difficulties. You have to take her in first just because, you know, the, the stats are there. Like she's probably going to win. But I, I, you know, I could definitely see I could see somebody sneaky in FPO. Like somebody could come out of nowhere in this event and it would not shock me. Um, and then my dark horse pick ties into my bold prediction. And that's Silas Schultz. And I think that could be a freebie uh, this week, potentially. Evan Smith was at 30th in the world. He was very close to being an excellent dark horse pick. So, yeah, we'll see what Hunter's got. That's what I got. All right. Yeah, uh, we're going to go ahead and throw it to Hunter remotely uh, for his pick. So we'll see what you got, Hunter. MPO last year seemed like a really weird tournament, finishing wise. So I'm not going to base it too much on that, except for the fact that I'm going to stay away from Calvin Heinberg. So I'm going Ricky Wysocki one, Gannon Burr two. This is my sneaky one, Kevin Jones three. I might regret that. And for Dark Horse, if it's not obvious already, this player is in my top three. So he better be my dark horse because I need him on both fronts. Kevin Jones. For FPO, I'm going Christian Tatar, one, because I'm not an idiot. Cat Merch, two. And I will probably regret this one as much as I regret my Kevin Jones pick, Paige Pierce, three. All right, cool. Thanks, Hunter. Um, so that's going to go ahead and do it for uh, this week's preview show. Get out this weekend and watch the Des Moines Challenge. We'll see you in the next one, guys.